Jim, cheers. Thank you for your time, mate. I think it's going to be great for the community to hear about how your career's progressed, but then more importantly, how much effort some of this community work is and, and things that you've done over the years. And I think it's going to be very enlightening for people. So as a, as a starting point, could you give us an intro into who you are and what you do, please? Yeah, sure thing. So my name's Jim Moyle. Um, I currently work from Microsoft. Uh, I've got one of the strangest titles in the industry uh, because I'm a, a, a global black belt, as they call it, for Windows virtual desktop. Uh, I came across to Microsoft from uh, a company called FS Logic, who Microsoft acquired um, about a year ago, a year and a bit ago, and uh, where I was the chief technical evangelist previously. Awesome. Perfect. So how, how's the career of, of Jim Moyle been, right? So he's, he's been, been doing a lot over the years, right? And there's been lots of little little roles left, right and centre and little pivots along the way. So let's, let's have a bit of an insight into how you started out and how you got to today. Um, so, so when I started out at college and uh, in university, such like a computer science degree or courses wasn't really a thing. Certainly wasn't in, uh, in Blackburn where I grew up. Um, so I, I did science and I did uh, biochemistry and genetics in university and then uh, ended up uh, running rock pubs. <laughs> nice. Uh, and then really found out that I wasn't, wasn't going to uh, make any money doing that. So uh, ended up doing IT. I ended up doing, you remember Compaq as a company? They used to make a Compaq Presario home piece. It's going back a while now for some of your audience. Um, and I used to do phone support for home users on Compaq Presario PCs. And, uh, and then, yeah, did my MCSE back in NT four days. Uh, and so sort of went from there. Brilliant. And you, you've obviously been in the, the the reseller space. You've been in the vendor space. You've been in internal IT roles. You've been kind of all over the place. What, what's the journey been like from like a, and how has it affected you with regards to going from like, I don't know, internal IT support roles to reseller to vendor spaces and all that kind of, how do you find that kind of pivot and change? So that's been really interesting actually. And like I've, I've been in sort of working for vendors for the, the last 10 years. So I really enjoy that space. Um, I think that when you're doing end to end IT, you get stuck with the same set of technologies and the same people. I mean, the people might be great, but it's still the same. Um, and I, I, I meet so many people who are working and they think their job is boring because maybe it's because it's repetitive, maybe because it, it's the same set of technologies. And then, you know, you, you do some maybe consultancy, which kind of gets you out of that a bit and gets you a bit more of a breadth of interest in terms of different companies and different technologies. Maybe um, at, uh, at a VAR, you know, you then sort of stepping up from there. And then a vendor, you're constantly being bombarded with different architectures, different ways of thinking. Like I'll go into, you know, a global financial one week and they'll tell me all about how they do stuff. And then, you know, you'll be in like a retailer the next week. And, and this sort of constant lot of information about how people need to do things differently, what their requirements are, the solutions they've thought of, I find endlessly fascinating. Yeah. And that diversity thing is key, right? So having different of opinions and approaches helps one to keep the uh, good old noodle going and thinking of different ways. But I think from my perspective, I think with managing teams and bringing people together, that diversity and inclusion thing is extremely key. I think getting different views and opinions is the only way where we grow and get different approaches to stuff. Yeah, and if, you, if you're in a meeting with a customer, it doesn't matter who they are, and you haven't come away learning something, even if you're supposed to be the, the expert who goes in, then you've done it wrong in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So what does what a, a day in the life of a, a global black belt at Microsoft look like? Um, so there's a, there's a split between sort of like internal and, and external because we're very close to the engineering team. So there's that feedback loop to and from the engineering team in terms of, you know, what are they thinking of developing down the line? What do we think of that? And us bringing all the feedback from the field, from all the partners we talked to, all the customers we talked to, and bringing that feedback back to the engineering team as well. Mm -hmm. um, also, we're 
there's quite a lot of work in bringing some of these internal teams together mm. because you know it might be that there's a, a field requirement so let's say a developer workload and maybe the people in charge of the azure dev test lab just haven't had a chance to sit down with the guys from the windows virtual desktop team mm. but in the field you well actually hang on we need to tie these things together in some way and then you get to, to talk to all the different teams and, and try and figure that out. So there's that internal side. The external side is very much a, a pre-sales role, although you obviously you wear a number of hats and you help out where you can. Um, taking customers through the journey of where they are, maybe you know they've never done desktop virtualization before. Uh, it was certainly an exciting time uh, of a spring bringing people into the remote working uh, mindset when perhaps they had no experience of it previously and then all of a sudden needed to be there in a week. Yeah. Um, and there's that, that sort of like evangelization, you know, the community work, whether it's writing tools that you share on GitHub or um, doing presentations at conferences or anything like that, that's also part of the role. So. Yeah, awesome. That sounds, sounds pretty interesting. So how, what would you say is the most memorable moment of your career to date? Uh, bad or good? <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll start with good, right, shall we? <laughs> um, I, th I think I think that some of the presentations I've done at, at the really big conferences, where I've got a topic that I felt really passionate about, and. Uh, on stage i mean there's a couple of ones that i've done in the past with uh with a good friend of mine called andy wood where we've uh done a good job at both educating and ent entertaining to a big audience those always stick out in your memory um becoming a ctp for the first time was really pretty special uh to me 10 years ago now goodness um so yeah so, some of the good bits there yeah definitely on the kind of the, the negative side of memories, right? So we'll, we'll cut, maybe touch on like the the the, mis the biggest mistake maybe you made in the career and the lesson you learned from it. Maybe we can touch it on that way. All right, all right, all right. Um, so this is go going back a, a while. And I was uh, the first vendor I ever worked for and they were sort of half vendor, half consultancy. And working for a big bank, uh, and in the days when you still went into data centers, so I've, not, I've not been in a data center in a very long time. Microsoft do not let me into a your data center, I'll tell you <laughs> that much. Um, and it was only open or you're only allowed in so between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. so that there's nobody in there working during critical hours. Mm. And I had, a, I had a, a bit of infrastructure to set up. I was not having a good time. I was really not having a good time. And it's now getting to sort of like four or 5 a.m. I'm like, I cannot get these two things to talk to each other. There's a network issue. Couldn't figure it out. All right, fine. So I went to the, the room where the, the guys who ran the data center were, because I'd been to see them before, and they had big rolls of Cat5 cable behind their head. Yeah. Can I have a Cat5 cable, please? And like, yeah, yeah. How long do you want it? I was like, about 90 meters. <laughs> I don't know why they did it, but they just like went, no worries. Take 90 <laughs> meters worth of Cat5 cable. So I took it out of the back of the server, down the corridor, through the canteen, into the other part of the data center, and then connected it to the, to the back of the other server, because it crossed over cable, so that's fine. Boom, all my stuff suddenly leapt into life and it was working again. <laughs> And I'm leaving at 6 a.m. thinking, man, I've done a good job. <laughs> I mean, I was under pressure there. It was not working. I, I am, in my brain, the hero, All right? And I go back to my hotel room and I go to sleep. And I wake up to like 30 missed calls on my phone. Hmm, that's a bit weird. People seem to be shouting at me in text and, and a lot of email. So I phone my boss, he's like, what did you do? I'm like, well, I just ran a cable. He's like, that's like a security air gap in the data center. You just breached every single security network role in the entire bank. 
and we're not allowed back into their data center. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah. Yeah, I probably should have thought of that before I ran a cable between two air gap parts of a data center. The more worrying thing is they let you actually do it. <laughs> I know, I know, I can't believe it. Um, so yeah, uh, what I learned from that is don't budge things in a big bank. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, don't run 90 meters of cable across a corridor. That's, yeah, that's a great lesson yeah. learned. If you're having to run a cable through the canteen, you should probably stop and think. <laughs> yeah, 100%. And um, when, when you were kind of choosing your, your career, right, and the, the way you're going, wh why did you choose technology? Why this industry specifically? I just loved it. Just loved it. It gives me such a sense of satisfaction when you've got a problem and you know you find some way to fix it and that sense of satisfaction you know you can you can get like two or three moments like that in a day it's one of the reasons why i like writing a bit of code as well because you get that tiny little puzzle and then you get that moment of satisfaction when you figure it out and you know you're feeling amazing and and no i love it i love the puzzle of it i love the satisfaction it gives you when you work it out yeah definitely and I remember I, I, I started out, I wanted to be a developer, right? So in college and I was, in my mind, right, I was going to write the world's best app at some point. And then you realize that when you go and become a developer for an organization, which is what I did when I came out of college, you soon realize that you're just writing code to pull data out of a database. And that wasn't as cool or interesting as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> so I decided to move into infrastructure instead, as you do. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think if, if you're looking at advice to give people who are getting into the industry, sort of sitting on that line between developer and infrastructure person is a really amazing and valuable place to sit. Yeah. Because you find so many people in the industry are in one of the other camps and they don't really think about the other. Whereas if you know how code works and if you know how infrastructure works, then you can solve a lot of problems that nobody else can solve. Yeah. So if you're either side of that, then make sure you've got experience, make sure you're looking at both sides of that equation because it's going to help you immensely. Mm -hmm. And I can't count the number of times where, especially working for a vendor, right? You go to, you go to um, the engineering group and you say, got this feature that's really needed. Uh, can you add it to the roadmap? And they go, sure, Jim. Uh, let me have a look at the roadmap. That will be done in about 18 and a half months time. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, it turns out that if you know how to write a bit of PowerShell, then maybe you can do it yourself. Yeah. Right? And maybe next week you'll have a solution for the customer. And, you know, the, the same is true in reverse, right? If you're a developer, but you've got some some experience of infrastructure, you know, you're not going to make mistakes like writing to HKLM when you're supposed to write to HK current user, yeah. you know, because you've, you've, you've experienced what problems that can, that can, uh, that can happen. Yeah, uh, especially in a multi-user environment. <laughs> and I think, um, I remember we had a session or oh, maybe just as you joined Microsoft, I think it was when the transition of FS Logics, we had the guys over from Redmond and we had that session uh, talking about some of the challenges of teams and integrating with any kind of VDI solution initially. I remember I was having a chat around when you went on a server OS to Microsoft Teams and it told you that you couldn't install the app because it wasn't server OS certified and all this kind of stuff. And we were like, well, to fix that, you could just do a HTTP header check. And then the guys in the room were like, you could, if you put it into the cycle of six, 12, 18 months worth of effort to do so. And it's not actually that amount of effort at time, but in the backlog of things they've got to do and what's the top priority, that probably isn't one of them. Even though to us in the room at the time, we were like, that was like the number one issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm probably not giving away any secrets there, but if you get told by a product group, it's on the backlog, right? I mean, that, yeah. that's, that's just like, go away. Yeah, yeah, it's in 12 months time. AKA yeah. never. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, I mean, like every, everybody, you know, every, it, it's all agile right now. So every three to six weeks, the engineering team will reprioritize their backlog and then, you know, do a sprint to, to tick off that those top 10 
15, 20 items on the backlog, depending on how many they can get through. And just because it's on the backlog doesn't mean that it's ever going to be prioritized into a next sprint. No. And I think that some people think that when they get that response, oh, it's on the backlog, they think that means it's on the roadmap and you just you just go boop, boop, through the through the list and then that that's just not the way it works. Yeah, I remember that because I know on I think it was on the WVD side of it, there was the portion of the Microsoft website you go to to see the, the backlog of requests. Um, and people automatically assume that the things that were on there would actually ever come to fruition when it's not necessarily true. It's just a request is waiting to be upvoted ultimately to become a priority. Yeah, so that's on the on user voice and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and and so sometimes, right, this is all sorts, I mean, this is not just Microsoft, right? This is a, every vendor ever. Um, you know, it, it, it may either just be a question of prioritizing because you got something that is hard to do, but has medium results in terms of software, mm -hmm. in terms of revenue rather, or whether something is easy to do, but it's got, you know, all of these calculations happen and they happen again and again and again. And I think that people often think that because it's their biggest priority, it must be everybody else's biggest priority as well, but it's, it's simply not true. Yeah, and I think we kind of touched on one of your tips, right, which is be that, that dev operations kind of hybrid person would be a great piece. So if we think of like two more tips for people starting out or or to yourself a few years ago, right, what, what would those two extra tips be? So it, I, it's generalize until you find something you love and then specialize. Yeah. Yeah. When you're first starting out, try and touch as many bits of technology as you possibly can from you know, networking to development, to security, to end user computing, to databases, to, you know, various different clouds. Go and have a look at how all of these work together and find the part that brings you the most joy. And mm -hmm. then go and specialize and become an expert in that bit that you love and cut the rest of it out of your life. Because the more you get to do what you love, the more happy you'll be, the more expertise you're going to gain. and and that love for the topic is going to shine through to your colleagues, your employers, everybody else as well. Yeah, I think it's come up a few times that whole passion, be passionate about what you do rather than just getting up and thinking, oh, I've got to go to work today. So if you ever get to that point, right, it's time for pivot and rethink maybe, especially in the technology industry, you can pivot in any direction. Yeah, I mean, let's face it, everything changes every five years anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you might as well learn something new because, it, you know, in five years time, you're going to be able to be the biggest expert in the world on that because even the people who were in that bit of technology before you, they've still had to start again every five years. So yeah, it's great that you can pivot, you can do whatever you like. Yeah, and on your journey in your career, do you ever feel like you've made any sacrifices along the way? Um, I don't particularly. I mean, a lot of the travel is is kind of hard um some that i love i love the community travel i love um that sort of the sort of sharing things um when it's like oh you've got to get up at 4 a.m to go for an hour's meeting in madrid and you get back home at midnight yeah yeah not so much um so i think i would have been more careful about what travel i i took up and and uh, and refused and it it's over the pandemic it's made it so clear to me how much the travel really took out of me in my personal life. Um, so I, I do a lot of running um, and it, I've been able to do some consistent training. And I realized it wasn't just the time spent traveling, it's the jet lag, it's the prep, it's everything else that really takes it out of you. Yeah, so yeah, I would, I, would, I would probably sacrifice less of my own time to travel. I know when I was in consultancy and I was working for a, a local government customer in, in the Northeast, right? And we basically found that I was there Monday to Friday. So I was traveling there on maybe Sunday evening and I was getting home late Friday evening and I spent maybe the weekend doing my washing and then getting ready to then travel again on the Sunday. So you only ever got a day to yourself, if that. And yeah. that's only sustainable for a certain amount of time when you don't have a partner and a family and all that kind of stuff. And you're kind of happy to, I won't say sacrifice, but have that choice to not maybe have that social life um for knowing full well that you can maybe bring that back into the remit in a few years time once you've bedded down in your career potentially yeah i think uh, i think 
doing the travel is quite a good thing if you're, as you say, you know, you're you're single or, or you you just got a partner who's, who's maybe you know happy with you traveling. Yeah, then yeah, then do it. Then. <laughs> <laughs> then do it then. But just just bear in mind it's gonna it's gonna start to hurt because like. As I say, I've worked for vendors and quite a lot of them have been, you know, central or west coast in the US headquarters. And that sort of like, oh, you need to spend a week at headquarters. And that knocks out at least two weekends of your year. Maybe you're out there four times a year. So that's eight weekends are just now gone from your year. Plus four weeks afterwards, if you get your jet lag wrong and you're just broken, yeah. for a week after you come back yeah it's uh i mean you still do it but like i say this uh this last few months has really made it clear to me how much that took from my life yeah definitely and i think hopefully the, we'll come on to positives and negatives and the impact on covid a bit later on but i think i think there's, a, there's quite a few positives to come out of the back of this i think with the, for the right employers anyway um yep. so do, do you think that there's been any point in your career where you've just gone, do you know what? I quit. Like, and then you've actually then sat down and not been emotionally strong and quit and gone, actually, hang on, let's work through this. <laughs> I, you know what? I haven't. There's, there's, there's been jobs I've wanted to quit, but I haven't wanted to quit the industry because I, because I get, I, I still love it. Even, even when it's hard, like um, there's one job I got sent to, uh, sent to Israel to help out an insurance company big insurance company over there and uh it just happened to be a time when the the conflict flared up and uh, there were some missiles coming into tel aviv from palestine and actually getting quite close and so like there was what i thought was a fire alarm test in the tower block and i'm like there so and do the traditional like european thing I'm like, well, I know I'm not supposed to grab my laptop and my jacket, right? <laughs> but I'm definitely going to. So you grab your laptop and your jacket and I turn around and everybody's coming back in. Well, hang on a minute. We're, we're in a, like, a tower block. Mm. Why? And they're like, oh, that was the missile alarm. You only get 60 seconds to hide. We've got a safe room in the middle of the... Uh, in the middle of the block, which was where you know where the um, uh, elevators, the lifts are usually. They also had a concrete and case safe room there for every floor, so they're all gonna head in, in there. And then sixty seconds later, if you're not dead, then you're fine. <laughs> so they were all coming out like, "Holy shit! You could have told me." Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I did have a bit of a moment there, saying, "Hmm, I shouldn't be getting like." But I, I mean, I, I reckon that if for, for the people who, who live in Israel or like going, that's nothing, Jim. You shouldn't be worried about that. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, stuff like that does, does make you think of it. Yeah, definitely. I think at that point I'd be sat there thinking, is this, is this the role for me? <laughs> Especially now as a, as a father and husband as well, I'd be like, not a chance. Right. If, if that yeah. happened, I'd be out of there. No. Of course, let's, 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 let's switch gears a bit and go on to some industry stuff. Um, so obviously the industry's changed quite a lot from NT4 days and Novell directory services and all that kind of stuff that we've all had to go for the pain of, right? But what do you think the biggest change has been in the impact? I mean, there's been so many, right? I mean, I'm old enough to be able to say the internet, <laughs> right? I mean... When, when I was a sysadmin, we used to get TechNet on like a bunch of CDs in a book that arrived for the post. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it seems ridiculous, but yeah, of course, the internet. We never used to be able to Google for the answer. Yeah, that's true. And I remember right. being in scenarios, right, as, as a consultant where you've gone to a secure facility where you don't have internet access and you've gone into this room and you're getting charged out at X thousand pounds a day, right? And you walk in and you're thinking, right, I've got my answers on my phone if I need it phone goes in the basket right that's that idea out the window go on to the terminal and you're thinking right let's try and get onto google or something or or ask jeeves or something along those lines yeah doesn't have any internet access fantastic right i'm gonna have to use my idiot <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um have you ever done this you've written a blog post and then forgotten you've written it and then you, and then you, and then you find your own blog post yeah that that that's 
that's one of the most. And also, the 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 most disappointing Google search is when you search for your error message and you only get one result, and that result is you posting on the company's forum saying, "Has anybody seen this error message?" Yeah, four years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, so, yeah. I, I think um, I think the other things for me that that kind of stand out is I would say like life changing things in technology over the last few years. I think obviously the whole virtualization space, whether that's server or end user, and then also the the, the the impact of cloud. Right, and if we take the the concept of would would people be able to have facilitated the the working from home scenario we've got now and things if cloud didn't exist, and Initially, people sit there and go, you could probably get away with it. But then you think about the explosion of collaboration and unified comms and Zoom meetings, pub quizzes and all those kind of things, not just the enterprise space, but the consumer space. Without that cloud ecosystem, none of that would have functioned. Yeah. And and, a massive player on that. And, and that, that's true, right? So if you're going to slightly bring it more modern than me just saying the internet, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely cloud. Because... People say, well, I didn't need to run up many cloud services. Well, but the people who were providing you those SaaS applications, they had to run up, you know, a hundred, a thousand times more backend services to cope with this immediate boom. Um, there's some interesting internal Microsoft uh, documents about what happened to Teams. Right, because Teams runs on Azure, and all of a sudden Teams had this unbelievable explosive growth, yeah. and of course, you know that backend infrastructure had to expand in in lockstep with the demand because people desperately needed it to work securely from home, um, and you know we were able to do that because we had a cloud mindset and cloud capacity, and. My area as well, Windows Virtual Desktop, enables secure remote working. Yeah. We had an unbelievable increase in demand as well. Um, and being able to scale that out was, was so important. So, yeah, even if you, as a company, didn't spin up 100 new VMs in Azure, I bet all of the services that you relied on to do the remote working had to spin up 100x more than they, they, they had originally. Yeah, definitely. And I think people underestimate that the power of the cloud. Because I know that everyone jumped on the negativity bandwagon of Microsoft and not allowing people to have instances in Azure because of resource constraints, right? But it, it wasn't necessarily resource constraints. It was about prioritizing who gets access to those resources. So blue light services and keeping people alive is a little bit more important than anything else. Yeah. At that and and being, being in Microsoft and part of that, it was exactly as you say, it was a prioritization call. If you were in any part of that um, pandemic response, then I'm sorry, you got priority. Mm. And that was it. And so I worked with, you know, like a, a building firm who was helping building the Nightingale Hostels in the UK, which um, for anybody outside the UK was just extra hostel capacity. And they got prioritized and they got all the VMs that they needed and all the resources that they needed because they were building hostels, right? And it's it's not just the uh, frontline people that got the priority, it's all of the um, related services as well that, that, uh, that you have to make sure can work just to make the whole response um, effective. Yeah, exactly. And I remember I had a few customers reach out from the healthcare side that wanted to enable remote radiology services, right? So, and, and we ended up doing like a WVD underlay with a, for this customer, a horizon overlay service with um, GPU enabled sessions, right? And yep. that was that was fun, just trying to find resource for that, that's for sure. Um, but that's purely because GPU enabled resources in general at that scale is not something that gets requested every minute of every day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I had the same same with the, with the building firm that I'm talking about, because obviously they needed a lot of CAD CAM and uh, stuff like that. So yeah, and, and also bear in mind, right, the, the just-in-time supply chain is broken. Mm. Yeah, so that thing that everybody relied on, and you know, it's the same with people trying to buy laptops. People couldn't even buy a laptop no. because that supply chain was 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 properly broken back to China. So, well, that's what kicked off for me this cloud journey for this customer specifically was because they wanted to get a lot of new Cisco UCS servers in, right? And they couldn't get any for an extended period of time because of 
manufacturing changes from China to Poland or whatever was going on. And um, they had to burst into the cloud. There was nowhere else we could provide that service in the time frame they needed. But the, the thing that amazes me the most on this entire pandemic, and we'll come on to this in a moment, is, is how all the red tape, all the things that slow transformation and change down, literally got screwed up, thrown out the window, and everyone just had this can-do attitude to get stuff done. And yeah. I don't know why that isn't there anyway. <laughs> well, I mean, I can understand it, right? Because you're comparing two different risks. The risk in the pandemic when everybody else had to work from home, the risk is that your business failed. So you're, you're going to take on the lesser risk of digital transformation. Whereas if you're doing day-to-day -day stuff, then your digital transformation might be what you consider to be the higher risk. So you're, yeah. you're not as keen to do it. So I do understand that. Um, there, is, there is absolutely a little bit of schadenfreude when you know, you're talking to somebody who a month earlier told you it wasn't possible yeah. and all of a sudden it is possible. Yeah. Yes, I mean, it's a, possibly a bit mean to think of it that way, but you can't help it in that way. Well, it's a simple kind of thing like, like a VDI project that would normally in the customer's eyes take two years to roll out with full-on adoption services and things, right, to, to less than a month. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I rolled out a 6,000 user environment in a week. Yeah. From, from nothing to production in a week. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, there's going to be challenges on that journey, but you're going to have those challenges anyway, probably even in the two-year cycle. Yeah. And, you know, so one of the things that I'm noticing now is that there's a lot of technical debt that's been accrued because people, mm -hmm. I mean, there's that classic, right? How do you want things done, right? You know, well, cheap or fast pick any two well mm. it was done fast and cheap or well you know basically it was done fast right yeah. so either it was very expensive to do or you've in, or you did it as cheap as you could because it's a temporary solution or hopefully a temporary solution yeah. and now people are realizing that either that they want to keep the remote working paradigm alive or that this is going on a lot longer than they first hoped so they're going back and, and optimizing now. So that trying to pay down that technical debt that initially accrued in spring and looking at, you know, their cloud costs and saying, well, what can we do about this? And there's loads of things you can do, especially if you did it in a rush back in spring. Mm. Yeah, and I know that I was spoken, speaking to some local Gov customers where um, they know that some of their like social services and community workers and things that were still providing service during the initial outbreak and things that they actually them, took it upon themselves to transition to a collaboration tool set that was easier for them because the one that they maybe were provided wasn't as feature rich or easy. So they ended up using things like WhatsApp for argument's sake, right? Which is completely non-audited. It's not PSN compliant and all that kind of thing, right? So you get to a point where how do I as an IT manager now, not necessarily gain control, but how do I get visibility and, and compliance wrapped around that? Because the last thing you want to do is give them something that's less functional than they've been using for the last six to eight months. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And I, I think you say you shouldn't say gain control, right? Gain visibility is much better because an IT department should be um, reactive, should be agile, should be enabling the business, right? Mm. It's such an old school mindset is gain control, right? Just make sure you've got visibility of what's going on. Make sure that people are safe as they can be and the, and the organization is as compliant as it can be, right? That's your job. Yeah, definitely. And so on the pandemic side of it, right? So there's been positives and negatives to this entire entire thing. So what do you think the biggest positive and negatives are that you've seen? Uh, biggest negative is like how many people are still using bloody VPN? <laughs> Honestly, it's like, it's the worst possible remote working technology. And everybody's like, I've got loads of friends in organizations. I'm like, so how are you connecting to your, oh no, they've given us a VPN and our laptop. Oh. How, how, how good is that? Oh, it's terrible. Or, or I've got four different VPNs. <laughs> I've got. Oh. Uh, so, I mean, yeah. you seen the uh, the picture that was just going around on Twitter and, and LinkedIn of the of the guy with a, a shopping bag with a PC in it from the office carrying it home because he had no device at home. So he was literally carrying the equipment from the office with a monitor and everything in this this shopping bag and then plugging it in at home. I couldn't think of one anything worse from a duty of care perspective and someone's health and safety 
then also imagine if there was something held on that device that lost it because the chances are pcs are generally not encrypted in the office because it's a trusted network yeah. and uh just imagine the, the amount of breaches and things and i saw i think um the ico announced a fine for british airways i think this week of 20 million pounds for a breach that they've had it, it begs the question right whether financially impacting in an organization that's already massively financially impacted with this COVID being an aviation organization is a clever idea because I think it's going to mean potentially more job cuts. Well, I mean, you, you, you can't make special cases, you know, where do you stop it? If, you, if, if the rule yeah. isn't applied consistently to everybody, then, you know, you're, you're on a, I hate using the word, but you're on a slippery slope there. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It just, just makes you wonder though, how, how the impact this will have on, in 18 months, two years time. That's the only, only challenge for me. So on a positive note from pan, pandemic, what, what, do you, what do you reckon's happening there? So I think on a positive note, many people have realized, A, that it's nice to work from home. I've enjoyed it for a decade and that they can and that the organizations have realized finally that they don't have to be looking over, literally looking over people's shoulder at a desk to make sure they're working to, for everybody to be productive. Hmm. Yeah, and I think um, I remember having this debate with, um, I can't remember who it was with now, it was on the problem solver session that I did for, for IGEL a few weeks back. And uh, someone mentioned around visibility and monitoring of staff. And there was a pretty good debate on that session um, around whether monitoring of staff was actually a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and whether that big brother-esque kind of idea comes into play versus is it actually looking at what people are doing or is it looking into the service productivity? What is the the, the actual monitoring you're doing, um, so like, things like late what, signing. What, what's, the, what's the business outcome you want yeah. from having X number of staff, right? You need a thing done, right? It doesn't matter whether people are busy working. You know, it's like, what is the outcome you want? Have the right people and the right time to do mm. that outcome. And <clears throat> if you if you have people who are effectively doing busy work, to look like, mm. you know, because they're being monitored and they're too worried about being monitored to, you know, maybe, maybe it's saying, well, you watch YouTube for three hours. Well, I was like learning how to do a new thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, rather than making up paragraphs and paragraphs of email of absolute rubbish, yeah. because, because being an Outlook rather than being in YouTube is more useful when you're, when you're doing monitoring. It's, 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 it creates entirely the wrong behaviors in your staff to be micromanaging in that way. Yeah, and I think there's that kind of like surfing the surfers, right? <laughs> monitoring the people that are doing it and monitoring them. And it just becomes that 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 downward spiral of just, just being too obsessed with analytics to a degree, rather than, as you mentioned, what is the outcome that you're after? What are the people there to do? Do you trust your staff? That kind of thing. Because if, if they're doing their job and it's doing what they were doing before lockdown, then I think you should be fairly happy right? Um, with the whole transition of working from home where people can't work from home. And I've touched on it in a few of these visit, these sessions around the extended duty of care of employers now of health and safety and, and have they got the right equipment at home? Are they sat on the bed all day? Are they hunched over on a laptop on a kitchen table and all that kind of stuff? And I know that I know Microsoft, for example, have got duty of care services in that extend to the home already. Um, yep. But not every employer does, and they're just kind of like, it might, makes me wonder what the, the American style of class action lawsuits that may go on in the future around people with back pain and neck cricks and all that kind of stuff, right? Because of having to work from home during this, 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 this time frame. Yeah, and I, I know a lot of people like to see uh, video. I think it's presumptuous to enforce people, especially if you're not talking, if you're just listening to have, make them have the video on, you don't know what people, I mean, although backgrounds are still are pretty good, right? You know, um, <clears throat> but you don't know what people's home situation is. You don't know, you know what people might be wondering past you. And I think it's presumptuous to, to make people do video all the time. And I, and I think that, uh, yeah, it's one of the things that, that people must, should be a little bit careful because it's almost like that, like I must see your face and so. Yeah. And you've got friends who are like, I've got 12 hours of meetings. I only used to have two meetings a day. Now I've got 12 hours of meetings mm -hmm. a day. And it's because you've got, um, you've got organizations wanting to make sure that they're there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I think that's, that's the, the negative of it for me is on that. But the positive is that work-life balance for people being better. 
as well as um, hopefully the the choice that people will get moving forward. So the choice of being able to carry on in this method of working or the choice to go into an office. Because I know personally for me, right, I, I've worked from home for a while in general when I'm not at customer sites and various other things. But I still like going to the office once a week. Um, yeah. Just for that walk, cool the conversation, catching up with people face to face, maybe having a drink after work, that kind of thing. Just just to the social element that you don't get being in the same four walls and talking to people over these things. It's not quite the same. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, 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 I do enjoy that as well. But, you know, it's best when you can just dip in and dip out of it when it when it's correct, right? When it yes. suits you and also when it suits your colleagues and that sort of thing, uh, mm -hmm. give people the flexibility and the choice. Yeah, and there's a video coming in a few weeks, which um, I think you'd be quite interested, actually. It's a, a concept of using VR for conferences, right? So, um, and using 3D sound to allow you to be in a conference room or a pub, as an example. And you'll be able to stand in the middle and hear bits of every single conversation and walk closer to the conversation you want to be part of and then have just that conversation. And then you've got people's avatars and faces based on the VR headsets and all that kind of stuff. And it allows you using like the, the Oculus Quest devices, do it kind of wirelessly, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, it's quite a, quite a cool little thing. I've got one of the guys that I used to work with, he done a video with us and we did this entire interview process in the virtual world on the top of a snowy mountain, which was quite cool. Um, cool. We open the mind up on what is possible. If we think about people traveling to West Coast America for a, a three-day conference and then flying back as an example, well, for the sake of $300, you could give them a VR headset and let them do it from their own home and still have the capability to do the 3D sound kind of interaction piece rather than breakout rooms on Zoom that don't work very well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be really interesting because obviously it concentrated people's minds on home working and remote working. And I know that there's a whole load of vendors who are working away with brand new features and, uh, and new things to cope with this, uh, with this new way of working. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So if we have a think about um, technology, what's, what's piquing your interest at the moment? What's, what's the one piece of technology you're thinking, that's something I'm keeping my eye on? So, oh, well, apart from Windows Virtual Desktop, which I have to say, right? <laughs> um, it's actually, so I'm, as I said at the start, right, I'm relatively new to Microsoft. And it's essentially Azure because I'm, I keep finding like almost like corners of Azure that I, have, I had no idea were there. And I keep finding use cases for it. And I'm forever sort of like magpie picking up different services in Azure and going, okay, I can make this, put it that way, and then connect that together and that together. And because it's all modular and, you, and it's all API driven and it's all, I'm like, I can do some amazing things by just jigsawing different bits together. And then you, you essentially create a, a new product, right? Just by doing, pinning these, uh, these services together. And I'm loving doing that at the moment. So, yeah. Yeah, awesome. And I know I was speaking to Ian Warren, which I'd never heard of uh, the whole I think Power Toys, I think it is, from the, from the GitHub repository. And I've mm -hmm. just moved back from Mac to Windows, right? So my Apple Mac Pro, which is there, is in pieces because it created a little mini mushroom cloud and filled ah. itself and it was warm. So you, I went out and got the magic folk out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I decided to get the Windows 10 thing. And I thought, well, I've got an ultra wide monitor and I've got this and I've got that. And I was thinking, now, how do I hell do I get things to snap in a location I want to rather than having to reorganize my screen every two seconds? And Ian introduced me to the Power Toys thing, which has quite a lot of useful um, modules inside it around fancy zones and like mass file renaming functionality, um, image conversion and compression, all that kind of stuff. Things that are in preview that may or may not get added to Windows 10 in the near future. Yeah, um, no, it's good stuff. Yeah, it's really good. And um do you think there's any like unsung heroes of technology? So my, my example of this is like the Microsoft flow scenario where people don't have access to something, but they just don't consume it because they don't know what it is. Or I've never seen it. And they're used to just, just getting on with things. Um, I'm, I'm going to say PowerShell weirdly, because I meet so many people who think who've only ever used it for like a one liner that's been copied and pasted from a vendor's, mm. um, uh, a vendor's uh, like documentation. Like I've written proper 132 GUI apps in PowerShell, multi-threaded enterprise apps in PowerShell. I've strung together 
all these Azure services in PowerShell. And because it's and like it's so universal now, it even works on Linux, right? Um, and Mac. Yeah. If you know PowerShell and you're an infrastructure person, you can do pretty much anything that your imagination has put in front of you. Mm. And for people to say, oh, I just uh, you can just write the odd script or something. Have no idea of how unbelievably freeing and useful uh, knowing how to how to do PowerShell properly can be. And I know that when I was in internal IT quite a few years ago now, and we we were too cheap to buy provisioning services right from Citrix because it was astronomically expensive back then. So we actually ended up creating our own version of it using VBS scripts on PowerShell. And it was on PowerShell when it first got released. It basically was a, a glorified pipeline management solution like DevOps, um, Azure DevOps. And it was literally just changing DLLs and registering them and pushing out new applications and reverting back to gold image and sequencing that build up all via code. And this is this is 10 years ago that, that we were doing this. But it amazes me now when I go to customers and they're like, yeah, we can't afford this or that. And I'm like, well, you could probably work it out <laughs> if you yeah. put your mind to it. Um, so yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of things that people can do if they just came out that little box and, and thought outside of it for 10, 15 minutes a day. Yeah, um, if, if, if you're somebody who's watching and, and you don't know much about PowerShell, you're interested in learning, I would recommend uh, PowerShell in a month of lunches by Don Jones. Yeah. That is how I learned, and that is how a lot of other people have learned. It's a great course, it's not so expensive. Go on, I am not paid by Don Jones. Uh, but <laughs> go, on, uh, go and use that to learn about it if you're curious. Yeah, definitely. And do you think there's any areas of technology that are underinvested or undervalued in, a, in customers that you see? Um, so this comes back to something I was talking about before, right? It's agility. Because you tend to find that people um, value stability over agility. Hmm. To the extent that that infrastructure becomes static. How many times have you walked into a customer or, or an organization and something has been created in that sort of project-based mindset and it's done and then it's like set in stone and it hasn't been touched apart from security patches for years if even security patches and modifications as well even if yeah and so you, they're not mutually exclusive is um, stability and agility you can design your infrastructure in such a way that it is resilient and you can also affect change on it. Mm. And being able to respond to an organization's needs, the business needs, in a quick and effective manner is utterly undervalued in such a large percentage of, of organizations that I talk to. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree on that, definitely. And I think that, that it's, it's that tunnel vision mindset, though, right, where people are, well, I'm employed as a storage admin, so I only ever look at storage, right, and things like that. It's very rare now that I come across them that don't only just storage, but let's take that as an example. And they just don't think about what the knock-on effect of the integration is or what they need to do to make it more versatile or, or agile, how we're going to maybe burst our backups into the cloud, for argument's sake, right? The amount of customers still that I speak to that run tape libraries. It's just, I just don't, it's just, it's crazy. I, I don't have a big problem with tape just because there is certain use cases where tape is actually still a very good solution. Now, it is a very specific set of use cases, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't look tape too badly. Yeah. Uh, for cold storage, for co effective cold storage of data, it's still, it's still full on air gapped off net. Iron exactly. Mountain stored kind of scenario, 100% yeah. right for extreme long-term retention where you might not get that air gap in a public cloud, for example, and it's a little bit, you can do it, but it's a little bit more complicated, right? Um, but there's things like that. But I think for me, like even for organizations to sit there and go, well, my tape library is up for renewal or, or I've got this. Yeah. Things. It's like, I, I, I know what you mean, where, where people have, have, have used the same solution for decades sometimes, which, mm. you know, is why you pick tape out, right? Because that's been a solution for decades and decades. And, and they've just not moved across and not even looked at what else is out there and not made a considered decision across mm. what is the available technology estate and should we keep this or should we 
do something better. So yeah, I absolutely know what you mean in that. Um, I've got one big issue with tape, right? And my big issue with tape is e-discovery for GDPR compliance and removal of PII. You can't find it until it's plugged yeah. in. <laughs> 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 or you've got a catalog inventory within the virtual tape library that says, this is where it's stored on this tape, go and find it. And then that generally is not what works in e-discovery anymore. <laughs> so cool. So let's let's move on to some uh, lightning round questions, right? So okay. Um, Last technology purchase? Uh, a heated air dryer for my clothes. <laughs> Random. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I mentioned that I do a lot of running. Uh, and usually over winter, I kind of like taper down a bit because it's cold, it's wet, it's horrible. But I signed up for, um, for uh, a marathon in February. And I've got an ultra marathon not long after. So I've got to keep my fitness up over the, over the winter. And uh, I'm having to dry too many clothes. Because mm. there's yeah. nothing worse than trying to put on wet running clothes to go out on a wet <laughs> evening and a, and a cold run. So yeah, I've purchased an electrical dryer so I can wear warm clothes when I go out for a run. Fantastic. I'd just be putting things on that every morning before I get dressed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, who's your biggest inspiration? Um, I guess one of my heroes is, um, is Terry Pratchett. Uh, sadly, sadly left us. Um, his incisive satire and commentary and ability to entertain um, and cheerfulness in the face of, face, uh, face of his uh, terminal illness was uh, all of those endlessly admirable qualities to me hmm. yeah that's, that's, that's fair enough and what would you say work-life balance means to you yeah i hate i getting asked this question <laughs> um but because because so much of my work is also my hobby right yeah and um, it's, it's very difficult to draw the line and and because i don't have any kids then it's, you know, you don't have to divide your time so quite so strongly. So I, I think that um, my work-life balance is okay, but I would not hold myself up as an ideal in this um, <clears throat> for, for this topic of conversation. Fair enough. And what did you want to do when you finished school? So I wanted to be a scientist. Okay. And work any, in a lab. Any specific area? Just wanted to wear a white lab coat and have like mad crazy hair. So biology, biochemistry is what I wanted to do. Awesome. Uh, favorite book? Favorite book. Uh, we'll go back to the aforementioned uh, Terry Pratchett and say Night Watch. Yeah, good book. Uh, most important thing to you? Most important thing to me, mm -hmm. as an item of possession. It could be item or person. Ah, right. Well, if it's a person, then it's going to be more wife, doesn't it? Yeah, 100%. Uh, what would be your words of wisdom if it was a tweet? Uh, don't fuck up. <laughs> nice. Must watch TV show. The Wire. And favourite junk food? Noodles. Nice. Well, I think on, on that noodle note, right, I think it's time to call it a, a wrap. So cheers for, for, cheers for your time, Jim. It's been fantastic. And hopefully the audience has got something from this session. Cheers, Kyle. It's been a lot of fun.